Hey, welcome in everybody to the latest edition of the Sports Fanatic News Baseball Show. As I'm joined again by the wonderful Alex Clark. A couple weeks ago, um, we talked about the Seattle Mariners and their offseason and how good it was going before the uh, lockout and before the holidays. Now we're going to talk about a Seattle great Kyle Seeger announcing his retirement to be a full-time father, as Alex is, of course, talking about this from the tundra. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Look, we're, we're completely snowed in. So much so as my background shows right now, it is much worse outside. <laughs> but how are you um, doing it anyway? Oh man, you know we get through the holidays right now. We're really excited that you know we had a good holiday season. But the problem is right now we it's always nice to have a white Christmas, but it needs to stop after Christmas and not continue off for the next week, which is my only week off of work because I want to you know go and do things as opposed to stay inside the family. So you know you know how it is. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all we're doing good over here. You just gotta make do, right? But um. <laughs> When it comes to Kyle Seeger, we'll jump right in on him. Uh, he had a career 36.9, or pretty much 37, you would round that up to. Um, yeah. A career OPS plus for the people that love the new OPS stack compared to OPS. His OPS was a 763, OPS plus 112. Um, he's a player that has obviously been pretty steady throughout his career. One time All Star. Um, was a little surprised he didn't make that one more time. But the biggest surprise, since he was a fielding whiz and still was at the end of his career, um, was the one-time gold glove. So that's something I would like to uh, start with for being such a good fielder throughout his career. How shocked are you, obviously, as a Mariners fan, that he's only won that award once? Now, I'm not shocked at all because um, the gold glove award itself, in my opinion, really holds almost no real weight to it anymore. The Gold Glove is mostly nowadays for players that can field decently well, but are more on better teams that are good hitters. Like, honestly, the Gold Glove Award, if it were actually fully realistic, then there was a good number that won it this year that would not have even been in our top three. And some people that were not even in the top three that should have won it. So to be fair, really, the Gold Glove Award, in my opinion, doesn't hold as much weight as it should. Because like you said right now, Gold Kyle Seager for years and years – was a dominant defender, was basically one of the best defensive third basemen where he was the benchmark. That's what he did. And the fact that he only has one, it's kind of what was one of the things that started for me that feeling of, hey, you know, maybe the award isn't isn't recognizing the right people. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes, obviously, like when you give it to guys, like we saw Chapman, I think like the DAs, there's certain guys that when they give it, you look at it and go, okay, that guy's got it. But other guys, you definitely fit more into the category of maybe they won it in the past, but now they're on a better hitting season, not necessarily their best fielding season. And then they still end up winning the gold glove just because of more name track at that point, like you were um, getting at, um, rather than any anything much else. Where Kyle Seeger, I think it also hurts <clears throat> when you're on the middle market teams to sometimes win the awards than it does if you're on the always on ESPN, always on MLB Network. Like, if you're on those teams that are always around in the national scene, uh, you're going to be seen more, obviously, which is therefore going to make scouts recognize you more because they're just going to have to watch you. So I think that goes a long way in that as well, not necessarily getting as many gold gloves or even all-star appearances, per se, with that type of voting. People didn't see him as much. Uh, that, that that goes a long way with those two things. Yeah, because especially you take a look at his uh, sets throughout the years. And one of the ones that kind of jumps out at me is that a lot of people talk about his 2014 years. That was the one that was his, you know, all-star year, MVP, voting in the 20. Like 20th in the MVP race, Golden Glove year. But if you really take a look, his best year, in my opinion, was actually his 2016 year, where he had a batting average, a higher one with a 278, non base of 359, and OPS of 859. And he was 12th in the MVP voting, but in that same year, did not get an all star appearance or a Gold Glove. So, yeah, also, I, mean, what I don't know if you know this, but isn't the OPS plus average like something in the one? Like teens or one twenties, the league average. I thought the, OPS, I thought the OPS plus average was like at one hundred. It is at one hundred. Like oh, I think okay, it's well, at one hundred, but do not quote me. I'm not a say, I'm not a serometrics guy. I'm not the big. That, that's why it's because I use them more as a guideline than actually being a big like Mac. Obviously, 
um, is a is bigger into sabermetrics. Um, where, but one thirty three, I know for darn sure is a great OPS plus, and that's mm-hmm. what add in the season that you just brought up. Uh, exactly, that's his career highest OPS plus. Uh, one thirty three, but twenty fourteen is the second highest at one twenty seven. Exactly. Uh, but one thirty three, the season you brought up in twenty sixteen. Um, was the career highest where it looks like he finished, according to uh, baseball reference, he actually finished 12th in the MVP in that season. Yeah. Yep, he finished 12th in the MVP season in 2016, which again is again kind of funny because the fact that he did not make an all star team or win a gold glove in that year, yet in 2014, he was 20th in the MVP voting with getting an all star and gold glove. And so he moved really, up a full eight slot without doing ex- <laughs> exactly. He won- <laughs> He did be- again. Hey, uh, Bryce Harper wants to have a phone call real quick. No, um, it, it, and that's why, like, if I, from what I remember from that season, he did a lot of his work in the second half. Seager's his throughout his entire career was kind of marked as you know the first two months of the season you're gonna be pretty slow, but then you're gonna absolutely destroy the rest of the season. That's yeah, what yeah. he did in a lot of his career. He was always one that you thought in April, May. Oh, you know, maybe he's losing a step, or oh, hey, you know, he's really not doing that well. And then, in <laughs> as soon as June rolled around, he would just start hitting tanks all over the place. He would be making these incredible defensive plays, and not to mention during the first months, he would also be playing extremely defense, extremely good defense. But that's what he was always known for. I'll actually, I'll share a quick quote from uh, Seattle. That was really funny after the 2020 season, where Seattle had two Gold Glove award winners. They had Edward White at first base, and they had J.P. Crawford at shortstop. <laughs> Kyle was here gave a quote saying, yeah, I helped both of them get their gold gloves. Whenever a ball was hit a little too far on my side, I let J.P. get it so he could make the throws, and then whenever I did get the ball, I'd throw a little bit low to uh, Edward White so you can make a good pick and look good. <laughs> and I'm like, that's Seager. I love that so much. <laughs> yeah, like you were saying before the video – uh, when we were talking, folks, before the video about how he was a kind of soft-spoken, great locker room, old-style leader, but he did have the, those guys tend to sometimes have the best quotes because they don't talk often, but when they do talk to the media, it tends to be those cool one-liners at times that that tend to be memorable because they don't talk often and because exactly. they're actually wisely said and funny said one-liners like that. that brevity is the soul of wit, as they say. Yeah, and so you definitely put that. Exactly. And also, I mean, the big the big thing for Seeger is I know <clears throat> um some people were saying because of his obviously he's had a few injuries, but like how would he age into his thirties? Well, I think he answered that question. One was a sixty game season, but uh then you had the twenty nineteen season he was still solid in, and then I think he really answered that question uh this season. Um mm-hmm where his final season of his career is the only season of his career. He had 99 in 2016, but uh, the only season of his career, he went over a hundred RBIs and also over 30 home run. Oh no, tied. He had 30 and 16. So, but over 30, I, that would still be correct. Over 30 home runs in 2021 at 35. I mean, a heck of a season to ride off into the sunset and become the uh, father of the year as Kevin Millar always self proclaims himself to. Now he has competition. Now he has competition with Kyle Seeger um, to become the father of the year. So I mean, how about that? Like people, like you've heard at times articles of Seeger with the injuries. How will a guy like him, and obviously being a great fielder, how will that translate into his mid thirties? Well, he retired after. Not the best average hitting season, but the best home run and RBI output season of his entire career. <laughs> yeah, so like that's the thing with Seager is that for me, I love looking at batting average, but this is one of those times where I think you can kind of you know push it off to the side. This is a time where Kyle Seager decided, you know what, I'm just gonna go out and hit really hard, and that's what he did. And 35 home runs is nothing to scoff at, especially in Seattle which is always technically really known as a pitcher's ballpark. So the fact yeah, that he more got 35 is insane, and then 101 RBIs. This was a team that, remember, at the beginning of the season, a lot of people said they were going to be fighting for a third-place finish in the American League West, and they did matter. They did extremely well. They had a very strong record this season. Seager is one of the biggest reasons for that. Plus, on top of it, 
terrible. The guy played 159 games of the 162 game season. You missed three at your age 33 season. That is insane. This guy here showed that not only can he play extremely good baseball, but he could be consistent. Yeah. He was a great defensive third baseman, and when they needed him to play DH, he played DH. But when they play, they put him at third. Yes, it looked like he may have lost a little bit of a step, but he also had that veteran wise of him that was able to throw, to like throw and make these plays where he didn't need to do these incredible dives or slides, but he did everything and made it look easy. And yet he was doing things that were incredibly difficult to anybody else. But he he uses veteran savvy to really become that kind of great player. Yeah. Yeah, well, you notice it with those guys that are just the amazing fielders. Like, we have one here. Uh, Seager was a better hitter in his career than this guy, Pedro Feliz. But we had somebody, Pedro Feliz, on the Phillies before. You could just tell plays that were hard for some people, like coming in on the ball or, like, coming back on the ball and making the throw. He made them look so easy. Where Kyle Seager, like you just said, was the same way. That's why I always loved him from afar watching on MLB TV, watching the highlights of when he, especially in his younger years, would make them for the uh, defensive plays uh, he would make. Where um, I think he's one of those guys since I, like I told you before, started playing baseball at a later age, I always resonate with the defense guys big time and love those guys because I was always good at defense first and then had to figure out how the hell to hit. Um, So uh, Seager... Seager was um, really good uh, defensively his entire career. He wasn't obviously you're going to lose a step in your mid thirties, like you said, but he still was very sound. Could make all the plays that were in his radius, and he has one of the best fielding and ranging shortstop. Well, had one of the best fielding and ranging shortstops next to him, um, in J.P. Crawford. So that allowed you to also just field more like you're in your thirties and not have to overextend yourself in that aspect, either when you have a guy that's getting to everything uh, next to you at shortstop. But um, for me, something uh, that also stood out uh, when it came to Seager in his career uh, has been not just his fielding and necessarily his, um, Hitting in the aspect of, like you said, he had the goods like mid 260s, the 278 season and uh, 216. But it's also, I feel like he wasn't talked about enough as being one of the better power hitting third basemen. Because 25, mm-hmm. 26, 30, 27, uh, 22, in, uh, in being out for some of the games, only playing 106, he still hit 23 in 19. And then in 60, uh, he hit nine and then came in and finished his career with 35. So I feel like he, again, I think it goes with, unfortunately, we don't talk about these guys in some of the markets in hockey. The Ducks are exactly one of those teams. Uh, you don't, they don't get talked about their stars enough. Um, he fits exactly into one of those guys. Because if, if Seager was on a different team doing consistently mid-20s homers at third base, fielding to that clip, uh, I definitely think he would have been regarded as one of the better power hitting and fielding third baseman, excuse me, by more of the masses rather than people like us, just like people that really pay attention to baseball and the baseball insider community. Well, no, yeah, you're hundred percent right. And that's kind of the thing that you look at with this is that when it comes to Kyle Seeger, he was a player that here in the Pacific Northwest and to like, again, the people like you and I that really pay attention it was obvious how good he was. He was a star. He was a face of the game for Seattle. But like we said, Seattle is a mid-market team right now. It's not big market. It's not small market. It's, you know, right in that kind of smack dab middle. Hopefully it starts to change really soon. But we take a look at it. And when it comes to what Seager did, I mean, yeah, you're exactly right. When you take a look at third base, so what are the things you kind of look for? Okay, I want someone who's going to be good defensively. Well, that's what Seager exactly was. I want someone who's going to at least, you know, not be a liability at the dish. Well, he had a career, what? He had a career batting average of, what was it? Uh, uh, I just, uh, 251. And in his last season, even though he only batted 212, still launched 35 home runs, second most on the team, only behind Mitch Hanniger, who finished with 39. What else do you want? Well, you know, a third baseman, especially if you're a veteran, you got to be a leader. These guys, his teammates were crying when he 
was like was pulled off the field. He got he didn't get the Jeter or the Mariano Rivera treatment, but he did get the pull him off the field at the last moment to let him have the full ovation. And oh my gosh, right now, if I had a time machine, I would make sure I was at that final game. But I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be able to leave without losing about 15 pounds of water weight from tears. Like, because that was a guy that everyone loved. He was a guy that this entire team loved. They referred to him as Cap, as the team captain. He was like, and I don't remember any time in, in Seattle Mariner history that any player was regarded with that much reverence, say Dan Wilson. And what, that was nearly 20 years ago. This guy, Kyle Seeger, is a one of a kind of gem. And he's the reason why he's not talked about so much is because he was so quiet. A lot of times, people in the media love to gravitate towards people who say more things, obviously, because it gives us more stuff to write about. I know, I've been in the media for years. But at that same time, you love the play. It's like, you know, the players who really get the work done are the ones that aren't always going to be the, I'm the center of the show. I'm the guy that's in the spotlight. No, those mm-hmm. aren't the players a lot of times that are doing the best work, as I think very much evidenced by Kyle Seeger, who was that old school leader. The old school leader of being able to, let's work the clubhouse a little bit. Let me teach the younger guys. I can say fully with full on 100% confidence that if, J.P. Crawford did not have Kyle Seeger right there to mentor him and teach him and be a friend and mentor, I can guarantee you that he would not be the level shortstop that he is right now. He's only going up. When J.P. Crawford first came to the team, there I'm not going to say there were character concerns, but he was very raw. He was very raw. Good and his defender. fielding was still, yeah, yeah at the MLB level, his fielding was great, but um, you still saw... His hitting, like how with some young players, his hitting carries into the field. In his young year here in Philly, you saw that where Seager, I think, made him realize you're a goat in the field. Even if you have a bad at bat, never let that carry into the field. Because he was also one of those players his entire career, Kyle Seager. If he ever struck out, he always was still going to make that great defensive play and never have that mentality where it gets you down too much that then you screw up and make an error. Exactly. And that was one of the things that J.P. Crawford learned from Kyle. Kyle was able to teach that, and he really took him under his wing. And right now, we're looking at J.P. Crawford more than likely. He's probably going to be the team captain next year because he's the one that said, I want to be the one to step up and lead this team. I'm the one that has has worked, and I feel like I want to carry on what Seager's done. And and you know, I believe him. I think that right now, J.P. Crawford with a good, youthful motivation. J.P. Crawford's also a guy that doesn't like to talk a whole ton to the media. He's not the guy that's going to be the I'm the star of the show. He's the guy that does his job and does it well. And that's yep. exactly what this team needs to carry on, especially from Kyle Seager, who really helped mentor this entire team. Yeah, and I think this also goes to, other than if you're the big, bad Dodgers and teams like that, mm-hmm. Sometimes the West Coast doesn't get the attention of the East Coast because I just looked at somebody like J.J. Hardy, for example, who I was talking about um, as being a uh, fielding first player uh, before, of course, uh, being a hitter. He he made three all-star teams, uh, it says, uh, and then also one, I believe it was two gold gloves. Uh, So and that's because Milwaukee's not that big of a market. Uh, And Baltimore's not that big of a market, but one's more central, one's more east. That that does fit into the kind of thing that you see on Twitter sphere and everything of people saying sometimes the West Coast middle market teams like the M's, that 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 factors into not getting enough eyeballs on Mm -hmm. those teams because you would even see the Baltimore games on sometimes and the Baltimore Orioles sucked and you're like what the hell are the Baltimore Orioles doing Uh, on Mm -hmm. on a national televised uh, game. So, like, that's why I point that guy out, because Hardy, I always resonated <clears throat> as a good fielder, power-hitting shortstop um, that that could put up good at-bats at the plate, but never was the greatest overall hitter, where Seager was the better hitter than uh, Hardy. Seager has a pl- over 100, like, better than them on the average OPS plus. Hardy has, like, a 90-something, I think, in his career. But, like, I just, that's I, why it's you, interesting you he makes the two extra all-star mm-hmm. games. And as like that, that just proves exactly what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it just goes with where you play. 
and that's simple. That's it's as simple as that, basically. Definitely, I was actually bringing up slightly with uh, Jeff, like with um, Hardy, the JJ. I always said Jeff Hardy. That's a very different Hardy. Um, but it's JJ <laughs> Hardy. Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> very different Hardy. One is like one hits stingers, one hits whispers in the wind. Anyway, um, no, but it's kind of funny you bring up JJ Hardy. He's one actually one of my favorite kind of like examples of why war is such a weird stat because him and Jeff Brancourt have a very so like have very similar career stats but very different wars because of where they are positioned at. Exactly, and it's kind of funny because one is regarded as a top of the line at the time uh, player, and one was uh, was kind of shown as barely above replacement level. So anyway, anyway, regardless, back on the Seeger. And all of this, I really, I, it's kind of funny because we talked about like other like big bigger market teams that were going. That kind of brings up a really interesting point about if Kyle Seager did not decide to retire, where was he going to go? Because he's a free agent. Seattle had already said, you know what, hey, we love you, but we're not going to be able to pay you the money that you want. So what are you going to do? And there was a lot of teams that were looking at getting Kyle Seager, and I find it really interesting because at, again, he's only thirty four. We, he's already proven that in 2021 that he could go. He could still go a good ways. And he had all of this veteran leadership ability in him that teams are salivating for to really love and nurture these younger players to turn them into ball players, which is something that I think is so, so undervalued. In well, that's baseball. why the Orioles, for example, brought in a guy like J.J. Hardy on their team because exactly. even in years they weren't good. He's one of those locker room uh, teaches the young guys how to field the position, just be pros, pros. And uh, that's why you have it. And the Phillies at the end of his career have a guy like Jeff Francoeur on their team. Yeah, and there's so many. Yeah. <laughs> and there's so many uh, good, good young stars that are so good at playing the game, but don't know how to be a major leaguer. And their good, raw, their raw talent is what got them to where they're at now. Now what they need is a little bit of just maturing, a little bit of molding that raw talent into something else you can have the best material in the world but if you don't have the best clay in the world but if you can't you don't have someone to mold that clay and turn that clay into a beautiful pot it's just a lump and that's kind of that's what i see here from Seeger. like he's able to nurture and take these players and turn them into all-stars turn them into gold gloves look at look at evan white who right now i'm gonna be honest Maybe seeing his way out of Seattle, that's time for another podcast, though. But then you have, again, again J.P. Crawford. So with Seeger, I think he could have gone, but I love this quote. This is this came from Julie Seeger, his wife, uh, released earlier today when that announced the retirement. Today, I'm, annou- I'm announcing my retirement from Major League Baseball. Thank you to all of my family, friends, and fans for following me throughout my career. It's been a wonderful ride, but I am unbelievably excited for the next chapter of my life. And that next chapter of his life is being a dad. Is being He wants to go and be a full-time dad. And it was really funny because uh, Julie Seeger, again, the wife who put out that post, is on social media quite a bit. And it's kind of Kyle's outlet for social media where it's fun seeing him be a dad there was a picture that was posted earlier this year where it was kyle with a little salt gun and he's just standing there (laughs) and and the caption of it was me with my fourth child because they have three kids their fourth child hunting down flies with a little salt gun and kyle just had this dead serious face on him and he just stood like a soldier waiting and that's just the kind of personality that he has and he wants to go and be a dad and i love and respect the absolute heck out of that although i will say i will say i would not be surprised even one bit if Kyle Seager within the next couple of years comes back to be a coach and help try to help with the developmental side of things, try to help out the younger guys, and the team hires him to be that kind of developmental guy, I would not be surprised if you know he takes a nice little contract to go and do that. Let's just also definitely not just a way to get away from the kids. Definitely not just a no. way to get away from the kids. <laughs> no, I, I I agree. I feel like um. That that's kind of with the way of a player when you look at those guys that are the locker room, the silent leaders, so to speak, 
those usually tend to be guys that turn into the coaches or turn into the fielding experts, fielding coaches, whatever you want them to be, to first start at with your team or a player development person, whatever the heck you want them to start at uh, with your team. Um, I definitely think that that's kind of something I thought about when he retired. But J.J. Hardy, to to my knowledge, hasn't become a coach yet. But when he retired, he was kind of somebody that I thought of that maybe he would eventually come back into baseball and be like a fielding coach or come back into baseball. and you know, Because like guys that just are those locker room leaders that know how to get it done like that, those guys tend to be the best leaders at pulling the best out of the next generation as coaches too. So I'm glad you brought that up because – I'm sure that didn't just cross into both of our minds when some, when he retired. I'm sure that crossed into most of Seattle's mind and um, probably a couple of other people in the game of baseball, like maybe the Howard Reynolds, like the people that really are in tune mm-hmm. as um, people that are analysts of the game um, now uh, would be thinking as well. But I think that about gives us a good wrap on Kyle Seeger's career and uh, what he did as the absolute captain of the Seattle Mariners, getting a great send-off. Uh, by the Seattle Mariners to now become the proud papa um, and become the father of the year. Kevin Millar, again, self-proclaimed on intentional mm-hmm. talk every year, now has competition <laughs> for the uh, father of the year. And maybe they can have Kyle on. Hey, he's a good guest. Uh, have him on sometime next year. Check out how his father of the year status is going. See how the race is going. Have Kevin, have Kevin Pillar and uh, Kyle Sear come on to see who can uh, – so who could fight people off from touching the thermostat? <laughs> That's I mean the true thing to see who's father of the year. Who can make people avoid touching the thermostat the best? No facts, yeah, true, correct. Or just the best thing. dad joke. Can we just have an entire segment of Kevin Pillar, Kyle Singers telling dad jokes to each other? Can that please just be a segment somewhere? Yeah, Kevin Pillar. Yeah. No, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, that would be fun. I mean, <laughs> I, I I'm. I'm happy for him to be able to, it's very honorable thing to do to retire, to um, be with your family and just be full dad mode um, as well exactly. and retire on your own accord. We talked about that before the video. So it's, it's great to see him get to go out on his own term. I do agree though. There's probably a good chance he will be back at some point in the future as a coach. And that will be fun to see uh, when that, if that does end up happening, when that will happen. But I thank you again for joining us, Alex. So you can say where people will uh, be able to find you if you want to do so. And if you had any closing thoughts as well. Yeah, I do have one closing thought before I kind of go on to my plug here. Um, I remember going back, and this will probably date me a little bit, but watching Kyle Seeger's debut playing against the, I believe at the time they were the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Or it may have just been the uh, Los Angeles Angels, I don't remember. But I do remember watching his debut. And I believe it was Howie Kendrick who did what they called the third baseman's test to him. Where Kendrick's not the fastest guy in the world. But at his first chance when Seager was over at the hot corner, he laid down a bunt with nobody on and made Seager have to make a play on it. And he did. And he did that trademark bare hand side throw over to first. And that was the first of May that we would go on to see over an 11 year career. And for Seager, I mean, what else can you really say? He's been a player that I wish nothing but the best for in retirement. He's earned it. He's seen a lot of crap over the last 11 years, but on a little bit of a sadder note, I'm not going to end on this sad note, but I guess I am actually. Um, Kyle Seager now joins what will, what will join Felix Hernandez in the Mariner Hall of Fame at some point as never making a major league playoff game. And that yeah. is something that's truly disappointing and truly sad for both of those major league talents. Yeah. Yeah. That's why um, for me, uh, it's even more that he decided to do the, uh, the family move at this point because he hasn't won yet. He hasn't even seen a playoff game yet. He definitely would have got offers probably from teams. Oh, first of all, the Mariners had a chance to be in in the race with how good their their, their team's improving. And if but if he couldn't get the money there and didn't want to take a cheaper deal, he definitely would have had offers from teams that were really in it and had a chance and just wanted another great fielder in their infield um to be able to complete the pieces of the pile. Or if they wanted a guy that could hit and uh, get the RBI potential, some people that miss out on other DHs probably would have looked his way. Uh, as well for for that aspect even so um 
it's sad to see him go at a younger age, but it's also great to see him be able to go out on his own accord um, at the age of 34 now and be the proud papa. Um, you can find me at JJBoer26. Uh, you're what is your Twitter if you want to give it out to the people? Yeah, so my Twitter is the Sports Guy 242 You can also find me on Facebook. Also, I do another podcast here with Overtime Heroics called Cheap Seats Chatter. You can go find us over on Spotify as well. Right now, we are doing a uh, Jeopardy-type style game of ML through knowledge of MLB The Show 21. So check it out. Check it out to see who knows the game the best. It's obviously me because I made the quiz. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, you'll see. Go check it out to see if Alex's uh, words are true or if he's uh, just uh, spitting out uh, false information, you know. <laughs> Am I full of hot air or do I know my stuff? I'll let you yeah. be the judge. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 exactly, exactly, exactly. But thanks again for joining us. This has been the latest Sports Fanatic News baseball show as we recap the great career of one Kyle Seeger as now he gets to be as good of a dad as he was a great MLB baseball player. Congratulations on the great career, Kyle Seeger, and can, and also good luck, not congratulations, but good luck on the next chapter of your life. Peace out, everybody. Stay safe out there and enjoy the new year, but stay safe in your new year as well. Have a new year. <laughs>